I'm good. Is that your phone going off? <laughs> it was, uh, just on cue, it was my my husband's phone going off. So yes. <laughs> Hi, y'all. Hi, welcome Hello. back. <laughs> welcome back. Uh, Mel, nice to see you. Things like that, all that. Nice to see Hi. you too. How are you? I'm good. Hi, I'm Tyshell. I'm a diversity, equity, inclusion practitioner and learning consultant, and this is my co-host. Hello, I am Mel, and I'm a social ethicist and an author. Awesome, awesome. And welcome to Brave Space, where we'll be having tough conversations around anti-oppression, communal healing, and all of those things. Today, we're going to be talking about the great outdoors, yes. camping and privilege, and all of the things that go into that. Yes. So, <laughs> that was a really weird start because, of course, it's like that 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 ringtone as soon as we start. <laughs> you know, we're but anyway, live. we're back. This is live and unfiltered, unedited. You're you're exactly. getting what you're getting. <laughs> I was yeah. I was gonna say you're getting it raw, but that sounds not where we want to. That's not what we want to be talking about. That's not what we're gonna be talking about this week. Anyway. Well, we are both in our living rooms, and you, I hope you feel that vibe. You're just sitting around the living room with us, having a good conversation, hanging out with our dogs. After Drink dinner, water, all of those in cozy things. clothes, <laughs> here we are. And today we're talking about camping and privilege. So I wanted to tell you all this, uh, a story about camping and privilege, because we like to start with a little bit of stories. I have, and I'll, you'll hear enough stories from me today. But I, I wanted to talk about like my experience with camping, my first experience. And it's so funny because, and we'll probably get into this a little bit later about um, the money it costs for camping and things like that. When I was a little girl, I wanted to go camping so bad. I had no, it was like on TV all the time. And they were like, we're going to go camping. We're going to go to our overnight camp. And that's not something I was, um, a B I was able to do. So I would get the JC Penny catalog. I am dating myself. I would pull out that What's huge catalog. Just kidding. I'm don't do that. Are. I was supposed to say, don't do that. Don't do that. I'll do that. So I would get out the catalog and I'd flip through the pages. And of course it was like route 66, which also sundown towns. Our long Route 66. That's a whole other episode. We're gonna it's a whole other episode. Yeah. But so I would get out the catalog and I would circle all of the things I was gonna buy to go camping. It was like I was gonna get a stove and a four hundred dollar tent, and not just a tent, but the tent with the two rooms and the cots and the sleeping bags. And I remember being in my living room having this conversation with my dad about wanting to go camp. He was like, "I am not paying." hundreds of dollars for you to go sleep outside you can just go sleep in the backyard and you'll be fine <laughs> and i just thought camping was this thing that was unattainable for me to the point where one easter and most black people will know this we get dressed up for easter whether it's church clothes or going out clothes i had my um my dad buy me an outfit for from six it was a denim pleated skirt with a, a denim collared plaid shirt with no arms and there are pictures of me oh, in it, but you dang. will never see them. We need to put them I, on Instagram. That's if I find them, them, I will. Honestly, I, yeah. I don't mind. If you post I was an embarrassing in, childhood photo, I'll post one of okay. myself. So, I anyway. was in love with this outfit. I wanted to go camping. I was camping. So I just wanted to ground with that story. Like, But I will say the way I got to go camping, because I have never slept in a tent. I still am trying to go. Um, is one year I got that same year my dad did get me a um, Barbie tent and I used to camp in the backyard in the living room so Aww. but it was it was very cute I had that tent from the time I was seven until I was like 13 so yeah anyway <laughs> um so I wanted to start just kind of talking a little bit about like I've always seen, and this is something that I, that I I I've said for many, many years after probably that time that I've always seen camping as like a white privilege vacation. And I used to tell people and people would be like, no, you don't have to spend money. And I'm like, but it's such a white privilege vacation. And people would say, why? And I'd be like, because most people of color, and I'm not saying all, because I can never say that paint people of color or black people with a broad brush and say we're all the same, we are not a monolith, but we do share some culture. Um, if you are struggling and you live uh, in a working class or below the poverty line and you're struggling to keep your lights on and your water on and all of these bills and all of your utilities paid, I'm not going to then spend money to sleep outside for a week. 
like without those things like that just doesn't make sense to most of us and if you ask my parent that's not we're not doing that like that's just something that we don't do but I really kind of wanted to peel back on that a little and talk about why most black people are afraid of the outdoors and don't go camping. And I'm not saying our generation, cause we are like moving away from that, but what that looks like in having those conversations about what camping is. But I'd love to hear like your experience with camping. Cause I'm guessing it's different since we live in different States. Yeah. <laughs> and well, we might've grew up in different places. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's a lot going on. There's the race and class it's you know, different parts of the country. I grew up in California. My dad was an Eagle Scout, which means like for he went all the way through the ranks of Boy Scout and achieved the highest rank of Boy Scout. So he's like Mr. Outdoors. So I grew up camping and, you know, gutting fish with my dad. And, you know, sorry to any vegans who might be listening. Um, you know, we didn't we were, I would say, lower middle class pastor's family. So we didn't have money to go to Disney World all the time or whatever. We didn't fly to places to have vacations. Our vacations consisted of camping because that was like a more affordable thing that we could do together as a family. But it does mm. strike me as very much like a middle class. Maybe it's now upper class. You have like glamping and, you know, you can rent yurts and sit and get like a $72,000 RV and go glamping. But, you know, I, I, I think of it as a pretty solidly middle class white pastime of like, going into the woods and roughing it but it, it is expensive to rough it it's not cheap to plan out all your meals and to to sometimes bring your own water and get all your gear together and you know that's and be and have the have the luxury of being able to take time off work like you said Taishal, when we were planning this episode a lot of us don't really think about the fact that if you're working you know two three jobs odd jobs you don't necessarily have the work-life balance to be able to take time off work so it, it is a luxury even if it's a lower middle class luxury it's still a luxury i mean I, I too i think one of the things that really gets me about it being um is this like the thought of trying to keep trying to keep all of your things on and then giving them up <clears throat> and i used to always say this um when people of color are going on vacation, like black people specifically are going, like, I wanna go lay by a pool and not work. I, mm -hmm. I have always been of the mind, and please don't, I hope no one gets upset about it, but, I mean, if that's, that you do, you do. But, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that white people don't go on vacations, they go on adventures. Like, y'all go on adventures, <laughs> like, I wanna plan an excursion, I'm gonna go climb a mountain, a rock, uh, I'm gonna go to Mount Everett, and I'm just like, my vacation is me not working. White people are like, let's go work outside. We're gonna chop wood, we're gonna make a fire, and I'm just like, we're gonna dig and a then latrine. at the end of, at the very end of the day, we'll have a glass of wine, sing songs, and eat a s'more. But all day you've been working, you've been carrying a canoe, you've been paddling, and it's like, it's a, it's a once in a lifetime thing. It's like, you know, it's also a once in a lifetime thing, going to an island and laying down there. Like, I, just I do never. know, that's God. so funny. I do know white people who are island, go lay on the beach island people. Like they just, they don't want to work. They want to sit. I was not raised that way. I don't understand it. If I'm not camping, I want to like be seeing museums and like, like seeing like cities and like exploring. Now that I will do. I have, whenever yeah. I go to um, a new city, I'll go to a museum, go get the food, things like that. But like client, yeah. I just don't understand like wanting to go vertical, like I, up a mountain. <laughs> I, just, I just never. Understood. I get vertigo up tall spaces so yeah and especially going down mountains quickly whether that's on a bike or skis or whatever nope i will just i will fall and break something so anyway yeah. but but this is actually a very interesting so my first thought my first like maybe insightful thing mm -hmm. that i might say today it's not going to be insightful necessarily i don't know why i just announced it that way i'm i'm about to be insightful just to let you know just so you know it's <laughs> just gonna to, be insightful yeah just, uh so i I'm interested to know, I'm interested to talk about the fact that white people often say, we're gonna get back to nature. We're gonna reconnect with nature. That is like the ju the justification often given for camping. Mm -hmm. And it strikes me that whiteness is wrapped around this idea of disconnection fundamentally. Like our default state as white folks is often to be disconnected from nature. So you have to take a vacation and go reconnect to nature as a pastime, as a consumer, but then you're gonna go back to your disconnected state. Whereas indigenous ways of 
being and in interacting with the world is always connected to nature. You're never Absolutely. not connected to nature. So that to me seems like it's a very white, a characteristic of whiteness in particular that you need to reconnect to nature. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. One of the things that, that when you said that <clears throat> it brings up for me is this thought of like why white people want to tan, right? Mm-hmm. So, so and, and I say that because it, so it used to be like white people and we know when we talked about the term white, um, it used to be for women for purity and how pale you were. And part of that was because only people who worked outside ag- agricultural um, farmers um, and even, you know, in chattel slavery, enslaved people were working outside, they would get darker, right? So people would, and, and white people were in the house, so these aristocrats were inside and they were pale. So that was their mark of being rich and having money. And now it's the opposite because of capitalism, we're often in an office under that, you know, that terrible lighting and you're pale because you're inside. And now it's seen as being darker is more beautiful because that says that you get to spend time outside vacationing and not inside um, being a cog in the consumer wheel of capitalism. So that's, that's it's, it's such an interesting dynamic and it is this reconnection. And you see that often with people who like, um, take these spirit white white um uh, i would say progressives that take these spiritual journeys to like ayahuasca or whatever they like want to go live off the grid and they go take these pilgrimages or whatever they call them um because they're like i want to disconnect from from the world and i want to disconnect from capitalism but really what they're disconnecting from is capitalism and white supremacy which drives capitalism so it is that same thing they want to go live off of nature but if we all if we really moved in this indigenous way of life and really accepted and what and didn't colonize um this land yeah then we would be we would be often be able to connect to um we wouldn't have to, we weren't disconnected from the land, so we wouldn't have to reconnect. We would be a right. part of the land. Yes. And it's so, so, it's so great that you say that because I think about that. And it's not like you had to come to what is indigenously the Americas, which was not called the Americas before we got here. You could have done that in Britain and be connected to the land in Britain and right. European places as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a different way of looking at the earth of us us not colonizing and being consumers of and objectifying the earth but being part of the earth and being a part right. of creation all the right. time right you don't have to return to it if you yeah. are a part of it anyway. yes exactly so and i wanted i wanted before we even talk about um and i know we were talking about this earlier but before we even talk about like black people's connections to the land i wanted to really um we are not experts in the in- indigenous cultures we don't we're not from those cultures specifically but we want to make sure that we at least um talk a little bit about the land back movement before we kind of get into our own um, conversation about it, because I think it's important since you did mention indigenous folks that um, there is a movement called land back. And I know you wanted to talk a little bit about it and I'll kind of follow up as, as well. If you because I just want to move that around since we already kind of brought that up. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So land back movement is it's a political ideology and it's also a movement, an actual movement. And I'm going to I'm going to do a little bit of reading because I want to make sure I'm saying it correctly we were talking about um this earlier what's what's the site you're reading from i am reading from landback.org actually there you go there you go so it is a movement that has existed for generations with a long legacy of organizing and of organizing and sacrifice to get indigenous lands back in indigenous hands currently the land back movement has fought battles at turtle turtle island from the north to the south south excuse me A part of that a lot of people know about is the closure of Mount Rushmore and returning that land back to public lands in the Black Hills in South Dakota. But that's not the only um, the the only uh, uh, land part of land back movement. Um, And this and and I want to dispel the misconception. So when people think land back, they often think, well, do I have to give up my house? It's not right now. That's not what they're looking at. And I'm not I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth. Um, They're looking at all public land going back to indigenous hands so that it's cared for by the people who've been caring for it for years. And we say that because, you know, Mount Rushmore is not just a symbol of, um, it's it's a symbol of white supremacy around the world that 
these people came and put their faces on a mountain that had a treaty in the in the Black Hills in South Dakota. So I wanted to at least share that, and I want to um, and I and let uh, Mel I'll add, let you add anything because I want to also share some Indigenous creators um, because, like we said, we're not the experts, but I want to make sure that people have those resources. So I didn't know if you wanted to add something. Yeah, I have a few things to say about that. Um, I don't know if you want to come back to that at the end as well, but yeah, the, sure. just the costs of the costs of outdoorsy culture. Whose land are we camping on? A lot of us don't think about that. A lot of us see a national park and say, "Yay, ecological preservation," but we don't think whose land was that before it was a national park. And the national park system is fraught with taking forcibly taking indigenous lands. Uh, the Black Hills in South Dakota, where Mar Mount Rushmore is, is a really good example of this. Mount Rushmore is uh, the Black Hills, one of the sac most sacred sites for Sioux people. It's seen as the birthplace of all creation of Turtle Island, which is what S Native people call North America. And so for Mount Rushmore, which was architected, by the way, by a man who had ties to the KKK, for, for white colonizing president's faces to be inscribed onto the, the hills of, of the Black Hills is is a and is a front to that sacred land and the u.s has broken many 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 i think hundreds of treaties with native peoples over native lands across the country and a lot of those treaties have been broken to build national parks and camping sites so yes we want to support ecological pr preservation there's nothing wrong with camping per se we're not trying to attack camping in this episode but it's really important to understand whose land are you camping on what is the indigenous history what is the history of the native flora and fauna that you are surrounded by are you actually digging into that and i think that's really important for us to know if we really do want to live in a way where we are connected to the land let's also be connected to the ancestors of land and the land and the people and be be not only grateful and aware but also mindful of not appropriating native culture while we're being outdoorsy because it's super common and number two supporting native causes like land back and indigenous creators so i wanted to make we wanted to make sure we centered that because with our voices that's not necessarily we're not um we're not creators that that hold those identities so we wanted to make sure that we center that as we center the bipoc experience in the conversations that we have so i'm going to mention some um podcast by indigenous people and i'll bring them up again at the end so that um if you didn't hear them you'll get to hear them so um i wanted to shout out the red nation podcast i actually was just listening to one of the creators of that podcast yesterday and they are amazing and i learned so much um uh, coffee with maya this land and all my relations and we'll link to those on our socials so i just wanted to mention those and i will come back and l m mention them again but i want to make sure that i'm not that we're not just talking about our own experiences but the experiences of um indigenous people and one of the things i thought was really really important about the land back movement is as well is that we want it talks about a true collective of liberation so it's not just indigenous people but we want to be able to put all of those together so it allows um for us to envision a world where black indigenous and poc liberation can coexist um and it's the political framework to put that together and and being and having that and, and enjoying that and engaging with that for allies as well so that is also important to us so while we were talking about it, I was like, let's just talk about it now. Yeah, um, we were on but, it, true. <laughs> but, but yeah, so I do want to say that, like, when I think about camping and things like that, uh, one of the things that always leads me back to is, like, why are so many people of color not camping? And, I, and I'll say yeah. that pre-2020, maybe pre-2019, things like that, because I will say I'm a part of a generation where we're changing that. But so when I was looking this up and I always get the same question, like people say, well, why can't black people swim? Why don't black people camp? And now while I do not think that black people are a monolith and none of us are doing it um, because so many of us have roots in the South and probably have camped in older generations, my family specifically was a part of the great migration from South Carolina to Philadelphia. Can you but, go into a bit what the great migration is for folks who might not know? Absolutely. So the Great Migration was after um, after slave after chattel slavery ended, 
um, and people were looking for jobs and economic e- economic economic opportunities. The, there was actually two waves of the Great Migration, but the first wave being people going up to places like Philadelphia, New York, New Jersey, Chicago, um, where they were moving in droves to find ac- economic opportunities and where they could be. Uh, not, and I'm not going to say free because people always think, oh, this is where people get that misconception that like racism only exists in the South. It, d- it does not. But they were finding jobs and it kind of mo- shifting away from like things, vagrancy laws where if you weren't employed, you could be jailed. Right. And we mm-hmm. know, and if for folks who don't, the 13th Amendment says that you can go back into slavery if you were in prison. And we still have that. If you haven't seen that, watch Ava DuVernay's uh, documentary, The 13th. And it talks specifically about that. But um, the first great migration being up to uh, Philadelphia. So my family has been in Philadelphia. But that's where I'm from. That's not where I am now, but that's where I'm from. Was in has been in Philadelphia, I think, since 1908, I believe. Um, the oldest picture I've seen, and this is another issue we could talk about at a different time with black people not being able to trace their lineage far, far back. The first picture I've seen, the oldest picture that we own in our family is my great grandmother in a, in a church in 1920 um, in Philadelphia. So, but my, no, my, when I did my ancestor DNA, it was like all of West Africa is part of you and then also South Carolina. So, the, and then hmm. looking at the great migration and what that looks like. So there was a second wave and this is where you get like the Harlem Renaissance and, and barbecue and all of those things traveling up with um, black people. So when I think about that and I think about why, when we, when we talk about why black people don't camp in droves and why that's not a part of our, or has not been a part of our culture in the past, we, I think about, things like epigenetics. And I'll talk a little bit about what that is because I don't want to just throw out scientific words, but epigenetics and generational trauma. So epigenetics says that like your grandmother, when she, before she, so I go very sciencey, forgive me for one second. <laughs> Let's as get a nerdy. Woman, right. As a woman, you were born with all of the eggs that you will ever produce, right? And as soon as you have them, your your offspring also, as soon as you give birth or not give birth, you are pregnant with them. Once they get to a viable stage, they will have all of the eggs, all of the eggs. So your great grandmother had you inside of your grandma, that kind of thing. So epigenetics is this, um, I don't want to say mutation, but it, what it is, is like this expression of your genes from generation to generation. So when you, when we look at epigenetics and I want to make sure I'm getting this com- completely right and I'm not way, way off, but when we're looking at epigenetics, it's really how your genes express from, from generation to generation to generation and traumatic events can change that. This is where we bring in generational trauma. And I'm going to talk about the generational trauma of chattel slavery and specifically when we're talking about the great outdoors and camping we're talking about lynchings and um escaping from um uh plantations through the woods things like that right so uh when we talk about like black people not wanting to be a part of woods the woods are often scary this is why if you ever watch a horror movie you do not see black people running the woods like that that if, if we're going into the woods, we're out. Like that's not, that's not us. We're not doing it because mm. you get these, like you, these markers on your genes that make you that I'm not going to say make you scared, but the trauma is passed down. It's passed down and it's kind of formed around and it's not saying it, you cannot go camping, but it becomes a part of your psyche and it be, the trauma is passed down through generations. So I think that is kind of my very layman's way of explaining it. I would call my, my husband who is a, 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 a scientist in, but that would be, we'd be here for another <laughs> hour as he explains it. So, and I will say that the doctors have studied it. Um, historians have studied it, geneticists have studied it, and it's there's not a consensus that trauma is specifically generational, but there are links that says that this that genes start to express a certain way. And I say one of the things that comes up for me is that um, that I am trying to break in my own life is that my mother was in a terrible car accident when she was pregnant with me. And none of me and my sisters got our, our driver's license before the age of like 22. Like that is a very close thing in our lives. And my mom still doesn't have a driver's license. I've had one for almost 10 years and have almost no driving experience. So, so is it because, so, 
so I understand that there could be an epigenetic factor there. Do you think there could also be just you you all growing up knowing that your mom was afraid of cars and then maybe you you were all right. afraid of cars? So it's yeah. not so, so there's when we talk about a the learned to trauma right. like yeah, handed down trauma also in relation to epigenetics. Yes, yeah, so when we're talking yeah. about epigenetics, it's not just um the trauma that exists for the for the two generations, three generations back, but it's also how that person interacts with that trauma, right? Yeah. So if, and, and I, we could use driving, but I'll, I'll use camping, right? So if your great, great, great grandmother, and we're talking, people think that chattel slavery was so long ago, right. but we're talking like grandmother, great, great grandmother, th things like that. <clears throat> um, if they were like, don't go in the woods or don't, you know, people were lynched there and we're talking, there still there was and I was actually just having this conversation with one of our producers and we talked about this young man who went camping or was in the woods with his friends and was lynched. So this is not as if lynchings were a long time ago. We still hear those kinds of things, oh right? My God. Yeah. Um, so when we're talking about that, when we're talking about like people being hung from trees, you just don't trust the woods. It's too expansive. I don't know how to get around. I, I don't know what's happening there. And also who's going to be, who's being kind to us in the woods. And when we think about it, a lot of black people, and I'm not saying all, live in closer proximity to each other, right? So when you go into the woods, who lives out there, right? Who's going? So when we're thinking about those kinds of things, so I think that that's a really interesting way. So it is how you interact with those traumas that make it different. So you're passing down the genes may be expressing in a different way to mm -hmm. have some inherent. Um, uh, trauma or being afraid of this thing, but then that person's going to interact with it as well. That's going to make that really like solid in your mind. Like, oh, we don't go to the woods. Oh, I don't do this. Oh, we, that's not something I um, am familiar with. That's not something I would do. And we're, I will say that we're trying to break those generational curses or traumas or whatever. Um, and I know we pulled, we had um, a, uh, 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 what is it called? A graphic that showed kind of um, the generational trauma one. So if you can pull that up, I'll just talk a little bit about it. Yes, so this is kind of this intergenerational trauma surviving European war. So it's not, this is not specific to only people of color. It's any group of people who went through trauma. And I'm gonna talk about the middle one, surviving slavery and racial violence in the American South. So this is Ashanti's great, great grandparents. And in the middle, it says traumas passed through generations. So there's the abandonment, domestic violence, and the, the low self-esteem leading to complex post-traumatic uh, syndrome uh, or disorder. And, you know, if you listen to Joy DeGrasse, she talks about post-traumatic slave syndrome and how that expresses in people of color. So it's always a good book to read. Dr. Joy DeGrasse, she has a book called Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, and then you can also watch her things on YouTube. So it's not saying that it's going to be specific and it's going to be this way, but this is the, these links that we talk about that we may not even know exist, mm -hmm. but we're dealing with these things. And then uh, if you can share the other, um, graphic that we had so every single person you meet is either repeating a cycle of generational trauma or carrying the burden of breaking generational cycles right breaking these cycles and if anybody knows millennials are out here really trying to break so many of these cycles that we've been talking about um so i just thought that was interesting i want to get your take on some of what what i was just talking about and, or your thoughts and things like that as well before i'm talking for the rest of the hour <laughs> Yeah, no, what I, I think this is, uh, first of all, I could listen to you talk all day, so that's not a problem for me. But I think this is a, a really interesting and important graphic to show, and I'm showing it up on the screen again, we'll post it on our socials, that there are many different forms of this. And it's really, I think it's important to be clued into how this can manifest no matter who you are or what mm -hmm. your skin looks like, that the things that happen to your ancestors gets passed on from generation to generation, not just perhaps genetically, but also from modeling from the ways that our parents treat us and their parents treated them. And if we are not actively taking a role in healing this stuff, we are going to repeat history because history repeats itself or history rhymes yes. as a, uh, as a, uh, Rebecca was saying Rebecca Larson said last time, last time we had an episode, history rhymes. So if we don't want to perpetuate 
the things that were done to us or against us, we've got to heal from that ourselves. And that and takes thing, a lot of work. That doesn't happen the interesting by thing about Right. I think the interesting thing about that is that you have to know that that's, that it's not just you. And this is why we always, we, you will always hear us advocating for therapy because, um, and, and yes, the very psychoanalytic Freudian lay on the couch type of therapy as well, but other types of therapy, narrative, people don't know that there's many different types of therapy. Art like therapy, therapy, somatic therapy, right. dance therapy. There's lots of kinds. Find your right. favorite. And go talk to your professional about what kind of therapy they practice, because not every therapist practices the same type of therapy. There's, True. I come from the, the gestalt and narrative therapy. Fancy. Like, she's like, I don't know. I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. <laughs> um, but so look it up. <laughs> But I, that, I mean, I'm a tra I was trained as a therapist and I was like, oh, I'm a gestalt therapist. And psychodynamic is like the things that happened in your childhood affect you now. So that's why I say that. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually lean more Erickson, which is um, psychosocial behavior than what Freud was doing with psychosexual behavior. Yeah. Because so, he only had three stages. I think Eric had, Erickson has five. But when we're thinking about that, you know, you should be talking to someone because you don't always know the things that in your, like you have to be talking to your parents about what happened with them. Cause so many people will just repeat what their parents were doing because they feel like it worked for them. But we're also repeating those same traumas. I was watching a, a girl on TikTok yesterday say, she said, I made a joke and, and it started to unpack my, my parents' trauma. And I was like, Oh, we're talking about this now. Like she was mm. saying her dad cooks a certain kind of food because when he was poor, he didn't have enough money to go buy that food. So he loves that now. And she's like, oh yeah, he's unpacking his trauma right now. So, mm -hmm. so please go to therapy, talk about it. Even if you don't have a, even if you think I'm living a great life, I don't need therapy. Unpack some of your stuff and live an even, even better life. But so I wanted to say that because black people's relationship to the outdoors is also very truncated because of our experience with it and our inherent dislike of it or the feeling of, of this unknown. And, and I'll even talk about, but then also with one of the things I know we were talking about too was this privilege that camping is. And we were taught, we, you brought that up a little bit earlier and talking about spending all this money and all this time off of work. And I'll talk to you a little, I'll tell you a little story about the first time I was preparing to go camping and like, a story of police brutality and things like that. So I was, and, and I'm by no means, um, I, I am, I live in a, a privileged life as well. Cause I was on campus at my um, graduate school alma mater and we were gonna go hiking in Colorado. So me and my husband were in a store and I was like trying on shoes, hiking boots. And I've never tried on hiking boots. I don't, I didn't have a reason until now. So I'm trying on these hiking boots and I'm putting them on, I'm taking them off. And my husband's like, you have to walk around in them. They even have this incline, and this is, this is me. Like they have this incline thing where you're supposed to lean forward and see how they fit your feet so your ankle doesn't roll. I don't know. He was telling me all this stuff, so I was doing it. So we're in the store. We're in Eastern Mountain Sports, which I don't think is actually, I think they closed that, that uh, store down a few years ago, before even before the pandemic. Um, so I'm, we're eating Eastern mountain sports and somebody comes over and they're like, Oh, do you need any help? And I'm like, yeah, I need some help. I, I don't know what I'm choosing from. I'm trying to make sure. And they're like, okay. And then they leave within like two seconds of helping me. And then, and then somebody else comes, do you need, are you still looking for any help? And I'm like, yeah, mind you, I have my, I have my alma mater t-shirt on and my coats off with my wallet on the bench and I'm trying on these shoes and i'm trying on these shoes and then my husband leaves to go put money in the meter and he's gone for a while because i think the car was like down down the street somewhere and i'm in the store and i'm trying on these shoes and i look up and i see a cop and i look over and i see another cop and then i turn what and i see another cop <gasps> and then and, and then i turn and then i look around and there are five cops surrounding me oh my god right you're just so, trying on hiking boots i'm trying on hiking <gasps> Keen hiking boots. I'm trying to. Oh look. my so god! So I'm looking, and I'm looking like this, and I'm like, this can't be a coincidence because one of the cops was like perusing like a sh like a shelf, like he was shopping. But it, but every time I looked up, he looked up. And mind you, I'm close to the back door, oh but god. the front door is all the way over. But I'm still my jacket is off, and I'm just wearing a t-shirt, and it's on the on the um, bench. And I'm looking and they are getting closer and closer and closer to me to the point where it's what? me and like five cops surrounding me. And oh everybody God, else in the no. store is like spread out. And the two people who were helping me, the two workers who were helping me were behind the counter looking at me, like <gasps> looking at these cops around me. And I literally sat down, 
changed. My heart is beating out of my chest. Sat down, changed my shoes, and left the store. I didn't buy anything. Oh my and god! And it was the it was the craziest craziest experience because I knew if I made and that was the first time I ever experienced like being surrounded by police. I knew if I made the wrong move and I wasn't careful and deliberate, I they they thought I could because I knew that that they had to think that I was steal going to steal these shoes because I, I'm wearing them. And I'm moving, I'm walking around in them because this is what I'm told I'm supposed to do to make sure my ankle doesn't roll in there with the right support. Five. And they're, cl- right, five police officers. And I'm oh. not talking like in the vicinity of me or in the store. Mind you, none of them were there when we got there. And I'm there for like 30 minutes and they are surrounding me to the point where, at, like, it, no, if I tried to run, which nobody's stealing hiking boots, they would have tackled me to the ground. And it was so bizarre for me because I left out of the store and I was like, my heart is beating. I start crying. My husband's like, are you okay? And I was like, I think they thought I was going to steal. And he's like, what? And he's like, I, what? He does not, he can't even comprehend what's happening right now because he wasn't in the store with me. And that probably only furthered what was happening because they thought, oh, well he left there probably. But I'm, I, I really want, and so I, I did, I complained. I let this, the store got back to me, not the store, but the company got back to me. They were like, they apologized that kind of thing through email. But the problem being is that, well, I just want to let people know, not, not just the problem. Um, because yes, people could say, well, maybe they were just in there or what, like there's so much. And as I've told this story over the years, people have been like, well, they didn't tackle you. And maybe they did think this. And I don't think that that was a problem. And I'm like, nobody has five cops surrounding them. No while people are trying on shoes because other people no. were in the store doing the same thing. And that was thing an that intimidation out, tactic. 100%. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, I, and it, this was years ago, probably eight, nine years ago now. And the thing I, that I really wanted to get across to people is like, just so you know, people who work at Eastern mountain sports and police in Philadelphia, cause it happened in Philadelphia, there's no street market for fucking keen hiking boots. Nobody's stealing <laughs> a pair of $120 keen. They not they're not Jordans. They have yeah. no street value. It's not a television. Oh they were a pair of hiking boots. And I just thought that was like so this is the relationship and that didn't really like enhance. So this is the thing when we talk about epigenetics and trauma, that doesn't enhance my need and want to go hiking if if buying hiking boots it's a, you're, it was kind of like, you know, driving while black, I was in the wrong neighborhood. I felt that kind of situation. I'm in the mm-hmm. wrong store buying the wrong thing. Like, why am I here that I must be stealing was the feeling that I got from that. So I just wanted to share even that story because it, it was, it's one I, I think about. And at the time it was really traumatic. And as I think about it now, I'm just like, I can laugh at it and say like, I can laugh at it because it didn't end tragically, but and there's no market for keen. Nobody's there's no street value for keen. That's hiking so boots. scary, Taishal. I'm glad you were okay. I that's it's just yeah. I, so you know you've talked about the hesitancy of black of black community, the black black folks mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. to not go into the woods, to not participate in camping or outdoorsy culture things. I wonder if there is also a function of white supremacy that wants to keep people of color out of those spaces as well. I wonder if it's both like, because like profiling you and saying like, Oh, black people don't buy hiking boots. She must be trying to steal or whatever people were thinking in that moment who called the police officers. Cause they had to be called. There's no way five cops are randomly accidentally hanging out at an Eastern mountain sports in the middle of the day. There's no way that's an accident. They're not right. just there to eat donuts. They're there to wash someone. Right. Mm-hmm. Someone called that. Someone made that. Some Karen made that call, right? Absolutely. So so there is a perception in that moment that, like, this isn't something Black people do. We we need to protect, like, I think there's an underlying thing of, like, we need to protect this as a white space. Like, I don't think people, oh, white people consciously think that, but I think that's definitely a factor, you know? Um, like, there's a race element here and there's a class element here right oh absolutely like the irony for example of 
criminalizing homeless people. Not that you're homeless in any way. This is switching the conversation, right? right, right. right? No, that makes sense. But the irony of criminalizing homeless people who don't have people who don't have homes, people who can't afford whatever, but then going to the woods and pretending like you're homeless, pretending like you're poor, pretending like you're roughing it. Like you cannot, how can you logically hold those two things together? You know, oh, absolutely. because this is the thing. And I, and, I, and I will say one of the things that I've always held true is that the things that that poor and working class people do, white people do for fun, right? Like they just do them for right. fun. Or it's kind of like when you think about what the super upper class food they eat are things that people just don't eat. And it's not because it's good. It's because, and it's only good because of the scarcity. So you think about things like caviar, mm. literal fish eggs. It's not, ex- it's expensive. And the reason that it's, it's, consumed is because other people can't get it Mm. right so it's not snail like you got to be able to prepare snail the right way octopus right certain things but these are things that poor people were eating before um before they came and took them away from those people so when you say thinking when you think about or when you talk about um pretending or going to sleep in the in the woods for a week and get back to nature and be a part of nature it's like You wouldn't live like that. Your house has six bedrooms and five bathrooms. Like, what are you talking about? Like, to me, it's it's just such a, the concept of it, of it is just so like, I I don't know. And I mean, we were talking about this too, when we were talking about how there's this new thing with van life, which Mm -hmm. is both, it's both sad and, and intriguing, right? For me, because, um, and it's, it's sad. And I say it's sad because millennials, are like cannot afford to buy homes. So they're choosing to not buy a house and instead renovate a van for $8,000 and live in that and go work remotely, which is like from through the pandemic, people can now uh, like large, because large groups of people can work and do their job remotely from anywhere. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's still a very privileged thing because if we had all of this money to give people homes or, you know, they're more, there are more abandoned homes than there are homeless people on the street, which is a ridiculous thought process. So everybody can have a home, but yeah. like if you're renovating a van or making a tiny home that you can put on wheels, there should be no homeless people on the street. There should yeah. absolutely not be any, but the fact that like, dr- like our generation, I'm not going to say everyone, but most people cannot with student loans cannot afford to buy a house. So people are literally turning their vans into uh, luxury vehicles homes. right yeah. luxury ve- and like and romanticizing in- it sure it's cr- but but crazy. kind of out of necessity right like right. Both and necessity and privilege yeah necessity and privilege yeah it's both it, it's it's a very strange mix of both but like like i was in seattle a couple years ago and saw you know tent communities right like downtown people like literally living in tents and hearing people disparage that like white hearing, hearing, hearing like middle and upper class white folks disparage these tent communities that are, you know, because the homelessness, like, you know, the people saying things like you got to clean up the streets, but then you literally go and pay $20 a night or $30 a night or $30, $40 a night to go to a national park and sleep in a tent. Right. And just because it's out of the city and you've paid to do it, that's okay. But people who literally have nowhere else to go, that's not okay because they didn't pay for it. Like, I don't think we realize how messed up capitalism has gotten our priorities and these values that we cling to so desperately. Like we romanticize this outdoor rough in it life, but then people who actually need to rough it are criminalized. Like it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I was just watching a, some, a social media, somebody's social media where they were talking about living off the grid. And they're like, people need to reconceptualize what living off the grid it means. It doesn't mean you have to live without running water. I'm like, it literally does because what this person was talking about, they were showing their house and they were like, we live off the grid. I was like, you don't live off the grid. You just created your own damn grid. <laughs> like they had because they, they had like, like solar we, energy and they, stuff. they did they were like we yeah. installed solar panels and ran yeah. these pipes through the ground and da, 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 da. and i was like so you just you just made your own grid you didn't you're not living off the grid you're just you have a grid you have a private so, grid that's like the most privileged thing i've ever heard of <laughs> so it's just, it's just this yeah. thought process and, I, and i'm not saying that people should not do these things like living in a van and traveling because hopefully we'll all get to a place where we realize that like capitalism and white supremacy is like we it's, it's not a system that works anymore so then we just 
um, decide that we're going to live our lives in the best way possible and work versus like living to work, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about things like camping, like there was no way my mom was like, I'm going to keep, I'm trying to keep a roof over your head. I'm trying to keep food in your mouth. I'm trying to do all of these things and I'm going to, instead I'm going to give them up for a week. Like that's not a thing. And yeah. I know we were talking earlier about two of my, and I, and I love these folks. There are two people I follow on TikTok called the through hikers and they spent three months traveling and they've done this before the continental divide trail from i think mexico to canada wow and they walked this entire trail but the amount of money that they yeah. had to spend to do that the amount of time like when they say they were they were doing it and they were getting they were part of nature and they loved it and they want loved being in the nature great that's great but they spent three months yeah they took three months off of work in whatever work that i think one of them even quit their job so they could do it and i was like what and they the the equipment that they had to have and now they didn't have a, a very they didn't have they had a tarp they didn't have a very expensive tent but they went through five pairs of shoes walking right like there are people who don't have five pairs of shoes over years of their life but they went through this in four months they mm. dehydrated food and sent it to themselves they 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 did so many different things that some people impressive. just don't it's have. Impressive they had a, a, right, yeah. they had an, a, a water filtration system so yeah. that they could, you know, scoop up water from a trough with a cattle and then filter it for themselves. And I was just like, that's not something that a lot of people have the time or the money to do. I could have never imagined taking three months off of work and telling my boss that it was because I wanted <laughs> to go hiking. Hmm the stability in that right like yeah. and i'm not saying that they are bad people for doing it i'm just no, saying no, no. that it's a yeah. privileged thing that most people don't have especially yeah. working class people have the luxury of being able to do now I, I have heard people say in arguments like well i grew up in and as you were talking a little bit about in your in your life that like you didn't have a lot of money so that was your vacation so i get a lot of people say that but that's still like you had to have the access and the time yeah. that not everybody even had so it's true it's true and it's a really interesting one yeah and it's easy to think about i mean it's 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 easy to forget that that is a privilege even if it's not necessarily marked by a lot of money because the time itself you know the time and the work-life balance uh to be able to do it is is and and the the knowledge like if you're if you're not taught those things by your family or friends like how do you Gain that knowledge of course nowadays i guess everyone watches youtube but now when i was growing up you, you couldn't just like look up on the internet how to do things <laughs> yeah you're dating um, so, yourself mel i know i know i know hey the I'm internet didn't exist I'm back in my it. day <laughs> I'm, I'm i'm proud i'm proud 36 elder millennial over here but i i just age like a fine wine you know hey, there you go yeah <laughs> or a cheese a very stinky cheese <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. do you age cheese not for very you long did, you did well you can no you can I, this yeah. is and here's here's my um my my nerd knowledge i worked at whole foods for a number of years in the cheese department and you can actually buy a gouda aged to 18 years it's like oh a God. crystal rock and it, it and it doesn't taste really good in my opinion but you can age a uh, cheese from anywhere from six months to 18 years i did not know you worked with cheese we need to discuss this at some point because i did i did i, 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 did. I, I, lo cheese I is loved adult it. candy yeah <laughs> and i'm lactose intolerant so oh no oh. anyway you have a lot of cheese knowledge i think for me this this conversation in my mind keeps coming back to the relationship of of people to the land, the relationship mm -hmm. of people to the land, right? We've talked about indigenous relationship to the land, being part of the land, being caretakers of the land. And we're not just necessarily talking about Native American tribes, indigenous as in there are indigenous peoples all over the world right, in every right, right, every right. continent, uh, caring for the land. It, it's a way of being in relation to, to creation, right? Um, versus, uh, versus a, what we would call, a white supremacist relationship to the land that's focused on colonizing and, and conquering and consuming mm -hmm. and by extension evoking fear and terror in for example black folks for from a history of white supremacist violence trying to use the land to cover up crime and violence right hiding mm -hmm. and hiding in the woods to commit crimes and to evoke terror so so the white supremacists we will call it a colonizing relationship to the land is oftentimes hidden 
in outdoorsy culture. And I want to give an example, a story about this, because it, that's, that sounds like a stretch, but I want to give a very poignant example. So I live in Maine. I live in like, it's like 95 something percent white. It was the whitest state in the country, I believe, one of them at least. And Maine decided in the early 1900s that it was going to rebrand itself to get more tourism, because before that it was just basically like lumber, like uh, right, pine. Right, right like pine forests for days, right? Lumber and fishing. In the early 1900s, Maine said, you know, we want to rebrand ourselves. We're going to start calling ourselves vacation land. Ooh, vacation land. Let's get all the rich white people up to Maine. You know, and, yeah. and today you have this, this legacy has been, you know, a hundred years strong, like the Bush compound in Kennebunk. You have like wealthy white people coming up and vacationing in Maine. It's a thing, right? Vacation land. Yeah. Uh, in the early 1900s, however, there was a lot of fear mongering by local papers trying to uh trying to basically push people of color out so that they could have a qu quote unquote i apologize for using this word a clean slate for tourists for white tourists to come in mm -hmm. so white people could come be in vacation land and be unbothered by seeing people of color and yes yeah, and, and and so here's an example of how this worked out there was a place called malaga island in 1912 it was uh populated by hundreds of mixed race and people of color. And the governor of Maine decided that in an effort to purify vacation land, literally, they decided, oh, Malaga Island, you know, that's a seedy place. We're going to evict all those people. We're going to exhume their graves, like literally wipe every trace of them from this island. They've been living there for generations. And we're going to put a lot, we're going to break up families. We're going to put a lot of them in an institution called the main school for the feeble minded and force them to be in this school. That school was renamed to Pineland. Pineland. It didn't close until 1996. And the state of Maine did not apologize to those residents until 2010. To this day, that island is deserted. They didn't even build anything. It's not even like they drove people out to build a resort or anything. They just didn't like that they were there and they just decided to evict them for no reason because they wanted to purify vacation land. So when we're saying that outdoorsy culture has a strong link to white supremacy, this is what we mean. And that's just one example in one remote part of the country. Think about all of the native peoples who've been pushed out of their land to make space for white outdoorsy culture, right? So. Is there something inherently wrong with camping? No, but there's a lot to unpack here that we need to be aware of. Absolutely. That makes me even think about like Seneca Village in New York City where um, there were free black people and living in this land and now people, and, and it was a lush community, a great community. And now it's, they made way for a park. Because, Central Park, I think, right, is built on yeah, top Central of Park. Central Park. Well, yeah, it's been done. <laughs> which is so ridiculous. the whole black community to build Central Park. Yeah. Right. And people don't even know that, right? So this is, you know, part of the reason we need CRT in schools, um, because it's not being taught in schools, but it's, right. that, it's that same thing. So this this relationship that people have to this land and just... And, 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 and as, as Mel was saying, going back, like, we're not trying to say you can't go camping and you no. should feel bad about camping, but you have I to know, yeah. right, you have to know where you are. You have to know what you're doing and you have to know whose land you're on and understand that as we are doing these things, because if you know better, hopefully you can do better. Right. Mm -hmm. So, and it's, it's, I, listen, I am. And, and when I get up to Maine, Mel and I are going to go camping together. Um, are are you going to go with me? Sure, I might be yes. sleeping in an RV, but whatever, you know. I mean, it's camping. <laughs> what did you imagine? No okay, all right, I'll camp like during not. the day, but I mean, I do want to go camping because, as we talked about in that in that graphic that we we're showing, I do want to break generational curses. I don't mm -hmm. want to be um, afraid of the land. I want you know my my children to be able to be a part of that. However, I want them to also know, like, I want the, you know, if we're, if I'm gonna go camping, I also want to my children to know if they're on indigenous lands, and this is why for me. Um, and if you saw, we were off last week because of Thanksgiving, but we were really trying to center native voices. And I've posted my land acknowledgement of the land that I'm on because I try to do that. I have it in my work email. I have it in my emails because I want to acknowledge the people who originated the land, who care for the land, who are trying, who are, who live on the land and have also then been erased from that land at yeah. times. And I don't want to center native, native erasure, 
but I want to center native voices and not shy away from the fact that erasure has happened and that reservations have to are a thing because we've pushed them to a certain place. It, it is not untethered or untied from the fact that gentrification is happening in black neighborhoods. It's the same thing, um, but native, is that, that's the original that happening. So when we talk about land back and things like that, I just really want to center that because I think it's so yeah. interesting. We're not telling white people not to go camping, but understand what your relationship is to camping and how privileged it may be and I, listen, I will always fight the fight and say that camping is, is a white privilege uh, vacation, sure, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't, but you should also understand and know and not just say like, oh, this is fun for me. You should also understand like yeah. what land you're on and, and who took care of it and and the privilege that we have in being able to take off time for work and do so. So I think that's also really important. Definitely that awareness, 100%. And even go beyond to say, okay, I'm not just going to walk into nature and be a consumer. I'm going to actually understand my relationship to nature and to live in in relationship to nature and to support causes that both that both uh, support the health of nature and the indigenous peoples. You know who who I can be grateful for and support to. I use the word support a lot, but but you get my drift. Like it's yeah, yeah, yeah. it's an, I think we. It, I think a lot of times, I know for myself and for a lot of white folks, just stop at guilt. Like, oh, I just need to be aware and guilty all the time. Right. Go be, Challenge yourself to go beyond that. Challenge yourself to actually do something in the world. Donate, advocate, uh, send, amplify like Michelle native said, voices. Amplify yeah. center of native voices so that people can help get the message across that caretaking this land is all of our responsibility. Justice is all of our responsibility. And we are we have a relationship relationship with and a responsibility to the land that we all enjoy together. Exactly. I'm going to tell another uh, another story about when I was when I was actually camping camping in Colorado, and this is just kind of a funny story because also black people tend to be risk adverse because like being black is risky enough. Just saying. Um, so I was in Colorado in in the hiking. And my, my sister-in-law and her husband live in Colorado. So they were, they go camping all the time. And of course they drive a Subaru or they, their camping <laughs> um, car is a Subaru. And my brother-in-law is driving up a, up a mountain in the Rocky Mountains, of course. And he's driving and I've never driven on a mountain. Like I didn't know that there were like car lanes on a mountain and they're not BRB. They're not, <laughs> or by the by, BYB. Um, BTB, whatever. Anyway, there are not car lanes, but there's this mountain that people are driving on and I'm sitting behind him and I'm like already like, this is not, I'm like this. I'm like, I can't, I don't, I'm uncomfortable. And I look over and when I look out my, the passenger backseat window, you know, I'm used to seeing streets, people, maybe even some trees. I look over and I can look down the nope. damn mountain. Nope, no, nope. no, no, no. Mm -mm. So we're going. I don't like and that. Then, <laughs> I don't like that at all. <laughs> so we get to this part where a lot of the cars can park so you can go further up the mountain because clearly we're at a part of the mountain that's still big enough that cars can fit on it, that kind of thing. And he goes, somebody is like trying to turn around at this part and he goes, oh, let me back up. <laughs> First of all, driving back up, up the mountain. off a cliff? Girl, what? this is... What? He what? goes, let me back up. And I said, first of all, driving up the mountain was a lot. He's like, I'm a reverse. I said, I'm gonna get out. <laughs> like, I'm, getting out of the, I'm getting out. I literally got out of the car and I'm gonna stand on this mountain. Cause that's, listen, if God wanted me to be at the top of the mountain, he gave me wings like a fucking bird. Like I'm not doing this. <laughs> so I get out, he reverses. He's like, see, it's not scary. I said, that's not something I need to see. I, I did not make it the many years 30 plus years, I think this was years ago. So 30 plus years being a black person to die on a mountain. Like that's not my life. That would be life. a that's dumb way to die. Like, I mean, there's some, oh. like there's better and worse ways to die. And that's the worst way to die. I will say I did get to like really enjoy. I did enjoy, we hiked. They hiked up way farther than we did. Like they hiked to the point where it was July and there was still snow on the mountain because that's how high they were. Oh wow! That's we stopped, awesome. took a nap. I ate some trail on a trail mix. I ate I ate trail mix on a trail, and it was great. <laughs> and I got pictures. And I'll probably go hiking again. But we stayed in a 
the, the other part is we stayed in a cabin and the, the person who owns the cabin kind of lives in the basement of where the, where the cabin is and they rent the top part and they're walking sticks. And she's like, Hey, this is not to scare you, but there, there could be bears out here. <laughs> So you might make sure you carry a walking stick. And if you see a bear, make a big noise. And I was like, the bear's not going to see me because I'm going to be in the fucking house. Like, I'm not. <laughs> if the bears want the land, they can have the land because <laughs> it's indigenous people and bears. Y'all can have it. Y'all got it. So I was like, no, I'm okay. <laughs> they were like, so the bears are not going to harm you. I said, that's not true. That's like when somebody tells you their dog doesn't bite. And you're like, he, the black person's response, this is, Truly, most black people, not most, a lot of black people will say this, he got teeth, right? Then he bites. Like, I, you can't tell mm. me a bear's not going to get me. Like, I understand that there are things, you there's bear mace, you gotta make a big scene, you gotta, he wants, you gotta be, get bigger <laughs> than him, you gotta sing, they don't. So we go on this short hike and I come back and and I just, my, my black self could not take it. So I was like, I'm gonna go back to the cabin. And the whole way <laughs> I am singing a church hymn. I said, mm, <laughs> me and Jesus loves me. <laughs> I was singing the entire way back. And I went in the house and I um I stayed there. Yeah. And they went camping. I mean, they, they did we get good. We had a they went uh hiking and I stayed in the house. And I'm not really sure if my in-laws think I'm crazy, but that's fine. Cause I'm alive right now. They're alive too, but I don't know. <laughs> I'm I'm okay. So. We went, <laughs> I went camping with my partner in uh, in Yosemite, and during the day we saw a bear ambling through, digging through uh, some, trying to get into the bear cans that they've got there. So I was like, that night, went to bed, and I every little noise in the woods, I'm like, I'm, I like bolt upright. I'm like, oh my god, it's a bear. And my partner's like, no, it's not a bear. Go to sleep. You're fine. And every well, every five do? minutes, <gasps> it's a bear. Because that tent, that tent is very thin. It's a, it's just a little piece of cloth. That that bear could smash straight through it. You but know what? There's something. If, if somebody goes, there's a bear, and they go, no, it's not. That the only reason he's trying yeah. to calm you down because what if it was a bear? If well, you no, because okay, here's here's the, no, 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 so this is what happened. So he wants to go to sleep, right? And I was like, every five minutes, just bolting upright, and he goes. If there's a bear, you'll either really hear it or you won't hear it at all. And then he goes to sleep. And in my half lucid state, I all night, I didn't get a wink of sleep. I woke up the next night morning with like big old bags around my eyes. And I was like, why did you tell me? He's like, why did you believe me? Bears weigh hundreds of pounds. You're going to hear them coming. So I was, I, he had me convinced that there were such a thing as stealth bears. And I, <laughs> I, I believed him like like but, an idiot like, <laughs> mel here's the thing i know you're gonna hear I, a bear even, okay you're even it if coming. it's a bear and you hear it or not hear it like if it's me versus the bear that bear's gonna kick my ass like there's yeah, not you can, like you can run away though if you see a bear coming i mean do you I, think I that are, it, are you supposed to run i should look no you're actually supposed to back away without turning your back to them because oh, i have yeah. had to research this because i was standing <laughs> in the cabin they were like make some noise because he just wants he mostly wants the food he doesn't want to bother They're you like but you dogs. don't you're not supposed to turn your yeah you're not supposed to turn your back on them yeah. because it's like inviting a chase so you're supposed to like get away from me i don't listen i don't oh, ever want to be that close to a bear no i don't like either. i'm good so yeah. hopefully you, we never we don't get you know right. stealth bears. bears stay, no stealth bears. Bears can stay far away. All kinds of bears, um, unless you're a teddy bear and you're stuffed, and then you can hang out with me. And <laughs> that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. For that. So, All right. That's a good place uh, to end. I think. <laughs> Any last we start words? just talking about the ridiculous things. So, talk, talk, so I, I wanted yourself, to make sure I re-mentioned um, those podcasts that we'd like to um, point you to uh, of indigenous, listening to indigenous people and centering indigenous voices, um, native folks. So the Red Nation podcast, Coffee with Maya, this land and all my relations are some indigenous creators. We will also share them on our social media so you have them. Don't just listen to us, listen to them too. I listened to yeah. Red Nation, the, one of the um, hosts of Net Red Nation on a different podcast and I immediately subscribed to his podcast because it was amazing. So I wanna, we wanna leave you with that. We will be back next week. Again, I forget what our topic is. If you no, go to our it. website. We're talking about the co-opting of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr exactly yeah so um we will see you next week any final words mel just uh thanks for an awesome conversation yeah we'll awesome. we'll talk to you next time everybody bye bye, -bye.